Coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. So eventually that kind of led to opening a small business and it just kind of ran in the background for years. So um, we would kind of slowly add a few products here and there. You know, it just kind of grew and grew to the point where I was like, gosh, you know what? I think I can maybe just make this my full-time job. And that's what it's been ever since. I don't know if I could necessarily do that in any other field or if that would ever happen again. I just kind of feel like it just kind of happened and I'm still not entirely sure how. That was Matt Draft sharing the story of the magical start of proof fly fishing. Cork, bamboo, rod blanks, and my rod building failure today on the swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Before we jump into it today, I want to give you a heads up that an easy way to support this show is to show your love for our sponsors. You can click over to any of their websites and, uh, and take a look what they have going on. And I want to thank you in advance if you get a chance to support this podcast and small businesses in one convenient click. Today's episode is sponsored by Stonefly Nets, who is putting quality before quantity with their handcrafted custom wood landing nets. When Ethan designs your net, it's his hope and goal to help you form lasting memories every time you're on the water. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly right now to get started. That's S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to Stonefly online. Today's episode is sponsored by Maverick Fly Fishing. They make the lightest Euro nymphing reel in the world, which makes your rod more sensitive, casting more accurate, and you can hold your dead drifts longer without shoulder burn. Check out Maverick Fly Fishing Stinger and their other Euro nymph products and support this podcast by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash maverick right now. That's maverick, M-A-V-R-K, wetflyswing.com slash maverick. Check out the lightest and most unique Euro nymphing reel right now. Matt Draft is back on the podcast with an update on what he's been up to and some more rod building tips. We find out how Matt built this business that doesn't require any marketing dollars. And, uh, and I dig into a bunch of other random questions that give us a feel for the how and why behind building a rod building parts business and one of the few uh, unique ones out there. Okay, let's find out what Matt's been up to. Here we go. Matt Draft from proofflyfishing.com. How's it going, Matt? Good, Dave. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. I was just looking back at our last episode. It was uh, it was episode 85, which is crazy. We're coming up towards 400. I think actually we're going to be around 400 by the time this goes live. And it was back in 2018, right? So it's been three and a half years. How's it feel to you? Does it feel like it's been three and a half years? You know, with everything going on in the world, it might even feel a little bit longer. So, but uh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, glad to be back. Yeah, good to have you on here. Yeah, we had um, there's been a lot that's gone on since 2018, obviously, but you know, now we're 22 going into 23 pretty soon here. Uh, I want to get an update on proof fly fishing. You know, you have this great rod building brand company and some good stuff here. So, we're going to talk about that and and I'm going to call myself out too eventually on some stuff on a rod that you sent. <laughs> so we'll talk about that as well. But give us an update. So between between then 2018 May of 2018 and now what's been going on with Proof and everything you have going? Well, we've been adding some new products. Um probably most recently and the biggest change is we've added a video series on how to restore a bamboo fly rod. Oh wow. And uh, that was very, po- it's still, it remains popular, but that's been a lot of fun. And we've been adding new products to kind of accommodate some of the, the needs for restoration work. That's probably the biggest thing right now. Yeah, that is pretty big. We've done a few other episodes with rod builders since then. And uh, probably the most recent one was, I think it was uh, Oyster Bamboo. Um, oh, yeah. We did an episode. Yeah. And then he's got a good operation going. To, well, they actually do. That's the thing. They actually do classes, right? Like in-person classes. And you have this resource too. Talk about that. If somebody wanted to, you know, kind of restore a bamboo rod, is that a pretty, is that a little bit more work than it is to build one from scratch? You know, a little bit, assuming you're starting with a blank. Um, but yeah, basically we take people, you know, for people that are interested in bamboo, sometimes the the cost of both a class and or like a new bamboo rod can be kind of intimidating. And so what we wanted to do was take, you know, you can find used bamboo rods on ebay you can find them at garage sales you know sometimes they're like 15 20 dollars 
And then, so what we do is start with kind of an old beat up rod and take you through stripping all the finish and guides off it, how to reseal the blank and then kind of build it right back like the original. Wow. So yeah, you guys go through the whole thing. Um, and that sounds like a cool idea because I know I've got some bamboo rods laying around. Like you say, you go to a, a garage sale and find something out there. How do you know if somebody's out there looking at the bamboo rod, you know, just on if it's worth it to actually, you know what I mean? Can you tell from looking at it, the quality or the type of rod and stuff like that? Yeah, for sure. So there's a couple things to look for. Um, the probably the most important part, two things, one to make sure it's not cracked anywhere. And the second is going to be the ferrules. You know, you can replace ferrules. Um, a lot of these rods are kind of what people label as blue collar rods. Very common back in the, I don't know, 30s and 40s. And not real expensive, but they're great fishing rods. But if the ferrules are in good shape, I feel like pretty much everything else can be fixed. Even if the rod's starting to delaminate a little bit. We did a series on that too, on how to fix a delaminated section. Oh, wow. Okay. So on your website, is this at proofflyfishing.com where they can go check this out? Yeah, it's under the tutorial section. Perfect. All right. So that's good. So that is a huge thing. I think that's actually, how did you figure that out? How did you determine that that was something, you know, is that something where you're kind of scratching your own itch or you're talking to your your folks? How do you know that that was the next step you wanted to take? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, I was restoring a rod for my son. He found an old bamboo rod at a garage sale when we were we were out one day. And so we took it home and then we just stripped the whole thing down and rebuilt it. And we just had a great time. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I should just do a video series on this and kind of see how it goes. I had no idea. That was probably about six months before uh, things kind of got a little strange with COVID and whatnot. Oh, yeah. And so then everybody's at home and it just kind of blew up on me uh, in a really good way. So That's pretty cool. So basically you do this thing. Now you got a lot of people. Did you... I mean, you know, you got all the products, right, that you have to, you put these kits together. So the other thing you do is obviously you just put together prepackaged kits, which is what I have. I have a spay rod that you put together, which has the blank, the cork, like everything you need to do it. So you have, and that's all there as well. Do you find that that is, um, that the bamboo is actually maybe even more of a, people are more, more of a hot topic than just doing your normal building from scratch? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, bamboo is still probably a little bit more on the margin. But it's certainly growing. And I think people, you know, there's just so many of these used rods on the market right now. And people just, I don't know, there's something about bamboo that has a lot of charm and mystique to it. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, it looks, that's a guy, I think all fly rods look cool, but I mean, bamboo, yeah, it's just like old school. It's a, kind of a throwback, right, to your dad or your grandpa sort of thing, whatever that is. Absolutely. Okay, so you have that resource. Well, let's just let's circle back. So we got episode 85. We'll put a link in the show notes to that. People can listen where we dug into this. But let's just do a little recap on the same thing. Somebody's coming here and they want to build a rod. You know, let's walk them through really quick. What are the steps without going deep on, you know, they have nothing and they want to, like, build their own rod? What is that? Do they have to do any prep before that or can they just get your package and go for it? No, you don't have to have any real knowledge kind of going into it. Probably the easiest way is to order a kit if you're getting started. And the kit's going to come with the blank, the grip, reel seat. And um, on our website, we allow you to kind of customize all those kits. So you can choose the what the reel seat's going to look like, the grip shape, the type of guides you have on it. So once you make those selections, then it's probably a good idea to hop over to our tutorial section. And we have videos and we kind of start off basically sitting at a table with exactly what you're going to have in hand uh, with one of the kits. And we just walk you through every single process and technique along the way. Right. So you covered all basically the tutorials and I'm looking at them now. You got the video series, fiberglass rods. So yeah, so that's the other thing. So you got fiberglass, you got graphite, you've got the bamboo. I mean, yeah, you just have a bunch of links. So pretty much somebody can come in here and start you know, like I do sometimes too, right? You get on something, you're like, oh man, this is, I love the video. So they could just click on those and just start like learning. And maybe might even be good for somebody to maybe watch these beforehand before they even get the package. Or do you recommend just get in the package and then watch them as you go? Uh, you know, people do it both ways. I think it's kind of nice to watch at least a little bit to kind of see what you're getting into before you jump in. But I think most people find that it's much less intimidating than they might have previously thought, you know? Um, in my mind, like if you can tie a fly on a leader, then you can you can build a rod. You know, there's just the skills um, 
involved in fly fishing, especially if you tie flies, then it's going to be a very easy transition to building rods. That's right. Because essentially there's, you know, when you break it down, you got the rod blank. So it's just the blank. And then you've got the, the steps are, the big steps are right. You put the, you get the real seat on. Well, again, I don't want to mess this up because I don't want to confuse it. <laughs> Let's let you just break down big picture. Give me the big steps on what it is to, you know, like real seat, handle all that stuff. Sure. Yeah. Well, there's different ways people do it. Um, for me, I usually start with the grip and then I'll do guides and then I'll, I'll finish up with the real seat. Um, but yeah, I think the part that people, you know, the grip and the real seat are very straightforward. The guides, wrapping guides, I feel like is where the skill and the technique really can come into play. But yeah, I think when getting started, I, I always tell people not to, I guess, A, complicate it too much and B, like take themselves too serious because you just want to have fun and kind of find it relaxing as you build the skills. It'll get more comfortable, just like tying flies. You know, what did your first fly look like? Probably wasn't great, but you might have caught a fish with it. So similar in rod building. You just take your time, enjoy the process, and, and the skill will come. Yeah, perfect. And do you guys cover a little bit? So you've got the fiberglass, graphite, bamboo stuff. Do you cover different, you know, like some like three weights up to like salmon rods and spay rods? Like talk about that. What if somebody can get, you know, what length of rod can they get here? Sure. Well, right now we have uh, all the way from seven foot to like a 13 foot spay. And the technique for building those is, is exactly the same. Uh, I usually find the larger rods to be a little bit easier to build just because you're dealing with a larger, you know, material. Sometimes those really fine tips can be challenging to wrap guides on. But yeah, there's really no difference in building a light rod to a heavy rod. It's all the same. Okay. And so you have seven, to, seven foot to 13. And then on fiberglass, do you have a range on the fiberglass as well? We do. Yeah. So starting at like a two weight and then all the way up to an eight weight in fiberglass. An eight weight. Okay. And do you find the people... I mean, I know fiberglass has gotten more popular. Do you sell still a lot more graphite? Or are you seeing fiberglass still increasing? Boy, I'd say it's probably about 50-50 right now. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is, uh, I guess, an increase in fiberglass from a few years ago. So still kind of going up, still gaining in popularity. Right on, right on. Okay. And I'm just looking at some of the, you know, some of the, the guides and things like that. When people are choosing, that's the cool thing about what you do, right? You put the whole package together and you can kind of adjust what you want. I'm looking at like one here, just the, like the, here's a good example, 10 foot, three fort weight check nymph component kit, which is cool because we're doing, we're putting together like a Euro nymphing uh, program and uh, we're going to be getting some people together to go do that. So this is right in the perfect timing. How does that look? I guess the blank is the big one, right? Because Euro nymphing has a really soft tip right versus some of the other these other things talk about that your blank so are these coming from you know i'm sure a lot of people that is that a big part of the cost of this is the blank it is that's probably the largest cost yeah you know we work with a number of different suppliers for blanks and that check nymph blank is probably one of my favorites there's two kind of defining characteristics of it in my mind of a true like check blank so one like you mentioned a softer tip for strike detection but second you need like a stiffer lower section because you're typically fishing with a decent amount of weight or weighted flies. And that stiffness in the lower sections help you uh, kind of lift that rig when necessary. Oh, okay. That's what it is. And then on the handle, it looks like you have your typical cork handles. What is, do you do any other like upper level stuff? Could people, if they want to do, sometimes you see these handles that are really crazy grains. And then sometimes it looks like almost like maybe there's an epoxy put over the, the butt of it. Uh, what does that look like? Do you, is, are there different handles or do you pretty much just cover a standard cork handle? You know, in our kits, uh, we have a range of different shapes that you can pick from. But as far as like um, applying epoxy or some sort of varnish to the handle, that would probably be something to do in the secondary. Next level. Yeah. But we did just, um, we just signed on with someone in Colorado who is wood burning cork grip. So she does amazing work. So like making designs. Yeah, she does trout. And they look amazing. So I uh, look forward to launching that soon. Oh, wow. Well, there you go. And actually, I'm, now I'm seeing, I'm just kind of checking out your site. So you've got the uh, the carbon fiber handles. We do. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's a new one too. Yeah, we did some carbon fiber and we also do some EVA. Which is like the plastic. Yeah, it's like a rubber sort of. Yeah, they're, you know, obviously not traditional materials for fly rods at least. But uh, I think people... Especially with like the, the carbon fiber is very, very stiff. It has a rigid foam core and people like it for strike detection, primarily for nymphing rods. Oh, right. 
Gotcha. And then the EVA is great for like cold weather. It just kind of gives you a little softer hold there when it's when it gets chilly. That's right. Yeah, I'm thinking of the old. I remember there was some old fiberglass when I was a kid. And remember, they, they came with some like foam, like really soft, you know, handles, which were kind of nice. Yes. So, gotcha. Okay. And just going through again, some of the things, maybe walk us through those things. I mean, if somebody's out there, if they wanted to go build a rod, pick up all their own stuff out there, is that a pretty challenging thing to put? I mean, I think it seems like for you, your business, the benefit is, is that you put together as a package and you have the tutorials, right? Right. But I mean, are people also able to go out there and dig up all this? Is it pretty easy to find all these, um, you know, the products for building a rod? Yeah, it is. You know, there's a couple sizing issues and that's kind of where our kits come into play is that trying to figure out the right size of like the tip and the winding check and what guides you need. It's not just a straight science. There's kind of an art piece to it as well, depending on what you're fishing for and what type of water you're fishing in and stuff like that. So we just kind of take that piece and have done all the calculations. And, you know, I've been fishing for 25 years. So I have a bit of experience as far as what guides are going to work in what situation. And we just kind of simplify that, at least at the front end. But yeah, I've got plenty of custom rod builders that uh, will just order up, just order the pieces because they know precisely what they need. Oh, and they'll just order it from you too. So you can just order that stuff without even. Yep. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay, that's right. Okay, and I'm looking at too the SIG jig rod dryer. So that, so is that the, um, you know, you put it on there and it actually spins automatically, you plug it in? That's right. Yep. So when you do epoxy, you don't have to have a mechanical dryer. It's nice just so you can kind of leave it and, you know, do something else if you want. Oh, okay. How would you do it? Because I'm used to the old, uh, when we were building back in the day, uh, we weren't using epoxy. We were just using, what's the other uh, type of uh, glue uh, you could use, right? The um, Varnish. Yeah, you were just doing varnish, right? So you yeah. you did have to spin it, right? That was a key. But you're saying with epoxy, you can, how would you do that without having a spinner? Um, you can do it with epoxy and varnish. You put a real light coat on, and then I just rotate the rod every like 15 minutes for maybe two hours or something can even do it while you're like watching TV or something. And that'll set up enough at that point that you don't have to rotate it anymore. Oh, cool. Cool. And, uh, and I'm looking at the Gorilla Glue. What is the Gorilla Glue used for? <laughs> the Gorilla Glue is a, uh, it's a finish on a bamboo rod. So you take the Gorilla Glue and you actually polish it onto the bamboo. It's a ton of work, but it makes a really nice finish. So yeah, that's its primary use, not so much as an adhesive, but as a finish. Today's episode is sponsored by Drift Hook, who has pre-packed fly assortments for every stage of your fly fishing journey. Each kit is organized by species and includes instructional videos and easy to follow guides. Their fly shop quality flies are hand tied and inspected before being carefully packed into their durable, double-sided, water resistant fly boxes. I've got one of those boxes right here, the Drift Hooked Streamer Surge, and it is super, uh, super clean. It's packed uh, with everything you need flies are well made it's got a, a row of some beads it's got a row of uh some rabbit strips it's got a little bit of flash there as i flip it over on the other side it's packed with some smaller flies it's got some muddlers and uh and it fits right there double-sided box nice and clean they have everything from nymphing to dry flies streamers to euro nymphs and everything in between uh, if you're brand new to it or know somebody who wants to get into fly fishing or needs a good present, uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, I would love to get this thing in my stocking, I can tell you that much. You can check out Drift Hook right now by heading over to drifthook.com and using Swing at checkout to receive 15% off your next order. That's Drift Hook, D R I F T H O O K dot com. Drift Hook dot com and use Swing, S W I N G, at checkout to get 15% off your next order and some of these sweet custom fly patterns. Okay, back to the show. Gorilla Glue is interesting because um, I've always been a big duct tape person, you know what I mean? But <laughs> I had this roll of uh, Gorilla Glue or Gorilla Tape, right? Like duct tape. I mean, the stuff's unbelievable. I can't believe how much stronger it is than duct tape. Literally, you put that stuff on there, it never wears out. I mean, it's like, <laughs> do you know what? Like Gorilla Goo must have some serious uh, tech in their products because I'm assuming that's kind of the same thing for you. Have you ever used any of that tape or what's why Gorilla Goo over like, say, Crazy Glue? Yeah, there's something just about the way, you know, I don't know enough about glues to tell you specifically, but like, yeah, you're right. It's incredibly 
versatile, right? Like it has incredible like bonding strength, but the fact that you can like polish it into bamboo and get like a waterproof yet flexible surface is, is kind of incredible. How'd you find that? How do you find all this stuff? Or are you, you know, like a grill glue? How'd you, you know, figure out that that was the thing to use? Um, that tip was actually from a friend of mine who figured it out. Um, Gorilla Glue works great, but generally I use um, an oil finish on bamboo. It's so much easier and it provides an excellent finish on bamboo. Right. So oil being, you're just kind of uh, rubbing the oil, the, the oil gets into the blank. So it's not necessarily sealing or it is kind of sealing it, right? Yeah. It's, it's not like it's impregnating the blank and that it's kind of penetrating it, but what it's happening is it's just forming this, um, you put on very, very thin layers and it just takes like maybe 10 seconds to put a coat on a, an entire blank. And then you let it sit and you do like seven or eight coats, polish it out and you have a flexible waterproof finish on your blank. There you go. Let's go down some tips. So we've been talking a little bit about this, but if somebody, well, let's just take me for example. So I've got this rod that you sent me and it gives the shout out or the embarrassment to me is that you know, I had all these plans of doing it and I just got caught up with the podcast, obviously, and, and stuff. And, and it sat there <laughs> yeah, sure. collecting dust, right? And so it's still there. I actually put the handle on and it's totally <laughs> my own fault. But so I have this rod, it's a spay rod and it's sitting there. I've got all the stuff. What are some tips as I'm thinking about getting this going again? What would be one thing to be thinking about? Okay, I mean, I've got your tutorials. What are the big like stumbling blocks of people when they're when they're building? I'd say most of the calls I get when people who are just starting out is that they're trying to figure out how to get their thread wraps both tight and not kind of overlapping. And so there's kind of a little bit of a, a sweet spot as far as getting enough tension on the thread without having too much tension. And you just have to kind of play around with that a little bit. But, you know, really there's, again, the process, the processes in like building a rod are, are pretty simple that you can make it as complicated as you want. But when you start off, you're, you know, you're wrapping thread around a blank and a guide and, the similarity is to tying a fly. Again, if you can if you can do anything as far as tying a fly, the process in rod building is going to be very straightforward. That's cool. And and so no, it is good. And I think from the first one, that was the point that was the take home is that, you know, yeah, it is pretty uh, straightforward. And then and I think I originally found you from the Geek and Gasoline, right? I'm pretty sure. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they have that series. I mean, that's still like a great series right out there that I'm sure people are still finding you through that series is uh but you've done since then now your own thing do you cover with your own videos i'm assuming you kind of have the youtube channel i do yes and uh we actually did a we i think our our entire bamboo series was put on uh lewis put it on gink too so, so yeah that's been fun right on yeah i'll have to look up that episode with lewis that was a that was a fun one as well. So, okay. Well, I guess we got the the high level update. I mean, the bamboo um, refinishing is a cool one. What are the tips? So if somebody's out there looking to get a bamboo rod, what would you recommend where they don't have to spend, you know, thousands of dollars? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple ways you can go. So we also right now are working with a, a bamboo rod maker in the U.S. to provide like brand new bamboo blanks. A lot of people end up taking that approach just because they can't find what they're looking for in the used market or they don't want to worry about trying to replace ferrules. We have the ferrules installed and pre-fit. Yeah, a couple of different ways to go. I mean, they're not they're not cheap, but when you look at the price of like, you know, brand new carbon fiber blanks today, bamboo seems to seem feel kind of uh, reasonable at that point. Oh, right. Yeah, so carbon fiber is uh, versus say, yeah, is that something I'm not totally up on that? What's that market look like? Well, you know, if you get like a, a higher end name brand blank, you know, you can spend... Yeah, north of five or six hundred dollars on just the blank. And this is different from graphite. Graphite is graphite, and this is carbon. So this is totally different. Or graphite, graphite, carbon fiber, same thing. So, but then you know you're looking at a brand new bamboo blank, and you're you know probably six fifty. And so that's not not too far off as far as uh, pricing goes. Well, yeah, because you think of some of the bamboo rods out there in general, you kind of think, well, I guess that's the thing. I always used to think they were more expensive, but yeah, you can actually get a new bamboo rod at, I think, a fairly reasonable price as well compared to some of these thousand dollar rods, right? Graphite rods. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you got to be a little bit careful with, with bamboo. There's a lot of imported bamboo blanks. I've looked at many of them and I would just stay away from the imported ones. Um, so if you're looking at a brand new bamboo blank and it's like, less than $300, it's going to be imported. So I would just, 
I don't know, personally stay clear of those. The glue's wrong, the bamboo's wrong, the tapers are wrong. They're just kind of not good. Yeah. And, and as opposed to, well, there's probably some similarities, but the graphite industry seems like there's, you know, a lot of the rods out there are pretty good, right? It may be hard to find a really crappy one, although I'm sure there's some, right? They're still really not good out there. Do you find that? Yeah, there's always kind of yeah. <laughs> the very, you know, the extremes of the spectrum. But as far as graphite and fiberglass, it's been kind of wild in the last 10 years or so the technology has really leveled out and so the performative difference you're getting between like an 80 dollar blank and a you know four or five hundred dollar blank is just not what it used to be which is kind of nice i think it makes it more accessible to more people and right it sounds like you're making this sound pretty easy. I think it is for the most part. Is there like a 201 level? You know, you got you got the basic fly rod, but what if somebody wanted to do some stuff that's kind of upper level? Do you guys also talk about that or provide products, tutorials to show somebody like, for example, maybe, you know, wrapping the, the thread in a, a unique way, right? Do you talk about that a little bit? We do. Yeah, we have a number of different kind of like specialized tutorials. Um, so those are dealing with like, working with metallic thread, how to do various trim bands. What's kind of fun too is like today people are using ink, like a special pigment ink that you can actually color the thread and do like a single trim band. You can do like a transparent wrap with like a, a black stripe in the middle. So all sorts of kind of crazy stuff out there. Right. Yeah. So most of it comes down to wrapping the thread as far as the 201 level stuff. Is that where is it? Or is there some stuff you could do with the cork real seed as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when it comes to components, you know, we sell a number of like agate stripping guides, for example, we get those out of Europe. And so, you know, you can, you can take it as high um, and as far as you want to go. And same with cork, our pre-made grips tend to be fairly straightforward. We use like a triple A cork, but we also sell cork rings for people that want to make their own grips. And those come in a range of different colors and materials. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, there's some products you have there that people can upscale it a little bit and i'm trying to remember now well i'm just thinking this is going to get me back on the hook to get that rod back going so as i as i get back in the office there and get it set up but you know how much room do you need to do this so you know is this something where it's probably good to have like a little station set up or you know can you do this kind of on the go sort of thing yeah when i first started i mean i would i would wrap rods on like our our dining room table and then i just kind of pack everything up and put it away when i was done one thing that we kind of specialize in is keeping the whole process simple. There's a lot of calls out there to sell you very elaborate, big, expensive motorized equipment to make rods. That has a place, but I guess our approach has always been to keep it small, keep it as simple as possible, minimize the amount of equipment and develop the skill. Yeah. And how much time does it take on the wrapping of the thread and just building the rod? You know, like we're saying with fly tying, right? You tie one fly, you know, it looks like crap. You tie a dozen and you're starting to get into the swing. Is that kind of the same thing with the rod that you got to do a bunch of these before you actually really kind of perfect? Like how many do you have to do before you really feel like you got it dialed? I would say um, if you take your time and you're, you know, you have decent attention to detail, probably your third rod, first two rods, it's kind of the first one, you know, it's, it's great. It's fishable. Uh, it's great for yourself. You probably don't want to give it away, but yeah, your second rod, I feel like you, learned a lot from the first one and you're just kind of fine tuning at that point but usually it's the third and fourth rod where uh you're getting to the point where your finish work is getting good enough and your wraps are uh, where you want them to be mm, okay and on that spay rod do you guys have is the 13 foot uh, I'm, I'm thinking that is probably a what a seven weight or something like that is that your main or do you have some shorter spay like stuff you know like uh yeah shorter Yes, we have a number of, uh, we call them switch rods, like 11, 11 foot. We have a seven foot, seven weight, eight, you know, 11 foot, eight weight switch, which is popular. And all the grain weights on that, that's all just lined up. I, I'm not sure on that 13 foot, what is, do you remember that window? Um, is that something you could find out easily what the grain weights are for that? You can't. Yeah, I believe they're listed on the site. Sorry, I'm not in front of a computer, right? but yeah, it's all there. Okay. Well, let's take it back to, you know, and I think you talked about this before on the first episode, but just to remind me, um, just take it back to on the rod building itself. How did you get into, you know what I mean? Like building, having this proof, this company around rod building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was uh, kind of a hobby that got away from me is the short story. But yeah, so when I, uh, gosh, I was in college, I wanted, I'd been fly fishing for a long time and I really wanted a bamboo fly rod. 
for some reason, I thought that it would be cheaper to build one from scratch than it would be to actually purchase one, which I'm not certain is true, but that's the approach I took. So I kind of built the majority of my own tools to do that. Yeah. And then just started building bamboo fly rods and eventually started selling them out of my basement. You know, I was a part of a number of different kind of rod building groups at the time. And one thing we noticed is that there was a very, very small number of suppliers that carried the quality of components that we were looking for for bamboo. Uh, so what we did is we formed these kind of groups, group like email lists, and we would do group orders. It started with cork and we would kind of pool our funds and buy directly from like distributor in Portugal for cork. And we could get an incredible price and the quality was outstanding. And then we just started to do that with other areas too. We did it with some uh, agate guides and some specialized kind of bamboo guides and stuff like that. And I was kind of the one who was kind of making all that happen, which was fun, but trying to explain during tax time why there was like $15,000 in your bank and then it disappeared and you didn't make anything on it is, is a little hard for the government to like wrap their mind around. So, so eventually that kind of led to opening a small business and it just kind of ran in the background for years. So um, we would kind of slowly add a few products here and there. And then, uh, you know, it just kind of grew and grew to the point where I was like, gosh, you know what? I think I can maybe just make this my full-time job. And that's what it's been ever since. I don't know if I could necessarily do that in any other field or if that would ever happen again. I just kind of feel like it just kind of happened and I'm still not entirely sure how. So when was that when you were kind of had it, it became your full-time job? About 10 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah, 10 years. That's amazing. Yeah, that's a nice chunk of time. It is. Yeah, it's been really great. I enjoy it. And where are you located now? Uh, I'm in Michigan, in Grand Rapids. Oh, you're in Michigan? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were just uh, we were just out there. Uh, I've been giving a shout out to. I was up in Ohio fishing for steelhead. You're right in the middle of things, right? Michigan seems, it seems like it is. It is right in the middle of the Great Lakes. It's like got great fishing. I mean, what are you doing when you go out fishing? What's your species of choice? Oh, gosh. You know, I fish year round. I love fishing, uh, you know, trout in the summer and spring. I do a lot of pike fishing, steelhead. I used to do salmon, but I don't know. I feel like there's too much pressure on the water right now for salmon for me. But uh, yeah, steelhead. Tried musky a couple years ago, which was a lot of fun. So yeah, a little bit of everything. Carp up by Traverse City, which are riot. That's right. Carp too. You mentioned the groups on the back when you got going with the rod. Are there still some groups out there people could like dig into and if they had questions or want to check some stuff out for like rod building groups? Yeah, there are. Probably the like classic fly rod forum is probably where I would direct people. It's a great, there's just a ton of people that know a lot about both building rods and both kind of the history of rods and stuff like that. So it's a great resource. Okay. Classic rod for me. I'll, I'll put that one in the show notes as well. Nice. Well, I feel like uh, we've got, you know, a, a little update, right, on what you've been doing. I mean, as you look out now, you know, it's been three and a half years. If you look out at the next three and a half years, you know, what do you see? So other than you got the bamboo going, are you going to keep things going as you have? Or do you have plans to maybe do some local classes or anything like that? I don't have any plans to do local classes right now. But, you know, what we're trying to increase is working with more and more kind of individuals and really small suppliers trying to I guess, kind of increase our like boutique offerings. So I mentioned the court grips that we're working with, the Woodburn ones. I'm trying to find different, you know, just individuals like that who we can work with. That's kind of how I got my start. And it's really kind of near and dear to, to the business and, and where I'd like to head with it. Right. So tweak it and add more, gives it more unique, right? So you can get these more unique products, but then you're also kind of working with other brands and doing some cool stuff and I imagine like rod cases is another thing. Is that something you offer somebody wanted a rod case with their rod? It's not right now. You know, there's kind of a gap in the market. And I think there's someone that's starting up a rod tube company, but very hard to come by right now. And I just don't have the space to do it. That's right. Yeah, because you have everything. Are you working, I mean, out of your home? You got your home office. Do you do everything out of there? I'd imagine there's lots of gear, lots of, uh, you know, lots of products laying around. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, so we're fortunate. We live in an old house. It's about 100 years old, and it has a full kind of walk-up attic. And so what I've done is kind of transformed the attic into like a warehouse and shipping center. It's pretty well packed at the moment. That's where I am right now. And so, yeah, you know, that's our, so we kind of keep it away from the the day-to-day -day living space and 
Gotcha. You got UPS coming here every day, like regularly. Is that what it looks like? Every day, every day. So <laughs> yeah. how are your neighbors? Are your neighbors out there? Do you got neighbors nearby? Yeah, we do. Yeah. No, they're cool. So they know, they know what's going on. So <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. We had uh, Joe Jackson on, it was talking about, he's a big like deer hair fly tying and stuff. And he's got uh, like, a, I think he said like 0.6 acres on his, you know, that's his house. So but within that area, they talked about how they literally, they have a farm there. Like they've got all this stuff, chickens, you know, essentially kind of right in the middle of, you know, in town, right? With neighbors and stuff like that. But he would say the same thing, how the neighbors really love them because they're giving them, you know, free eggs and, and stuff like that. But <laughs> but cool. No, I think, I mean, this day and age, which is really amazing about it, right? I mean, think of this, right? I mean, you go 20 years ago, how many of these things were you seeing where people had full businesses running out of their houses, whether that's, you know, online or like you're doing with product? It seems pretty amazing. Did you look back and think like, wow, 10 years, this is seems almost impossible? Or how does that look when you look back on what you've done? Yeah, you know, that's exactly how I look at it. And I think just like a lot of gratitude, you know, the, uh, the rod building community when I was getting started was very generous with both information. And, you know, sometimes people would just like send you materials or a tool or something and be like, oh, keep it or send it back when you're done, or when you can afford your own, you know, and and I think that was really just kind of pivotal in in this business. So, yeah, you know, a business has to be profitable if it's going to sustain itself. But in addition to that, you know, I just feel like I want to be as generous as I can with both the business and information. And that's just been a really great piece for me kind of personally, even apart from the, the economics of the business. So, yeah, I've just really found it enjoyable on many levels. Today's episode is sponsored by Range Meal Bars, made by a small team of passionate outdoor enthusiasts. The Range team only uses the highest quality gluten-free ingredients, and they know they want to fuel your body with the right stuff. We did a recent episode where we talked about backpacking and packing your pack and getting ready for a, might be a hike into a high mountain lake, and we talked about the power of food and getting the right food in your pack and how important that is to shaving off a weight And this bar packs a punch with 700 calories. This is a super dense bar, tastes good, and uh, and it's exactly what uh, we were talking about in that episode. So you can pretty much throw one bar in there if you had to. To be honest, this thing would probably make you through a couple of meals. I eat these things whenever I need to, and usually one chunk of this, one bite, will keep me going for quite a while. So it's quite a bit different now that I've been snacking on these for a while definitely than pretty much all the other meal bars because of the caloric intake. And this is important when you're out there for safety or on the water or just staying uh, from from that, keeping that uh, stomach from growling. Like I said, range bar is small enough to fit in your hand and slides easily into your pocket of your vest or sling pack, anything you need. They currently have two flavors. Uh, One is chocolate coffee and the other is molasses ginger sea salt. You can check out range right now at wetflyswing.com slash range. R-A-N-G-E, Range Meal Bars. You won't go back to the normal bar. Okay, back to the show. I don't see out there, I mean, you're the only one that I really see. Are there other people doing the same? Has anybody come in and is doing the same sort of thing, or is it just kind of you out there? No, there are a few others. Um, the majority out there are kind of these the bigger like box shops in the, in the rod building industry. But I think mostly they specialize in like uh, non-fly fishing gear. They have some, but I think they're the majority of their market is for uh, like spin gear. Oh, I see. Gotcha. So, so out of all the the brands that you work with, the products, you know, the cork, the the guides, the thread, like all that stuff, is it just a, a bunch of different uh, companies that you're involved with talking to closely, or is it like one? You know, how does that look? Yeah. No, I work. <laughs> there's probably about probably north of like 50 different suppliers to work with. So, and some of them like agate guides, you know, it's a, it's a retired jeweler who lives in Poland who is making these guides in his basement for me and, you know, stuff like that. And that's, I don't know. I kind of love that, you know, so I don't have to like go through a whole bunch of hoops to order stuff. I can just send him an email or give him a call and tell him what I'm looking for. Yeah, kind of go from there. I guess that makes it a little like volatile too, but that's kind of the way it's always been, you know? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. You got a small guy. So if he struggles, then you're not getting your stuff sort of thing. Exactly. So, but that's just kind of, you know, somehow made my peace with that and you just kind of move along. So, yeah, that's right. No, it seems like that's a cool, 
go away, do it because you're getting a unique product, right? And probably maybe even a better product as opposed to like a mass produced, whatever, right? Sort of thing. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. You can't compete with the quality. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if you remember that rod you sent me. Um, I think it just has the basic components, but it's got, you know, it's a 13 foot. It's got the handle, the real seat, the guides. What are the guides you put in with that typical? I'm not sure if you do the same thing, but if you were sending out a 13 foot spay rod, what, what would that kit include? Yeah. So um, that would include like a, a full set of guides from our um, our house brand guides. We do offer like an upgraded guide to like a U.S. made guide called Snake Brand Guides. So, yeah, it'll come with a full set, all hand fit. We'll hand fit the tip top, hand fit the winding check. And then, you know, we have a, a formula where we uh, we calculate the guide sizing and spacing for you. And, uh, yeah, we kind of go from there. Yeah, and you got it all covered. Okay, well, I'm going to put myself on the hook even though I've got a... <laughs> I've got to do a athletic health regime. Maybe it's a good time. I guess it's the new year, right? Think about it. But I'm going to put myself on the hook and get this rod dialed in. For you, what is your new year? I, I just, you know, if you're looking out, we're coming up to Christmas. Do you come out every year and think like, okay, I'm going to have my new year's resolution and throw something or what's that look like for you? Yeah. You know, my, my whole family, we, we sit together on usually New Year's Day and we come up with both family goals and individual goals and kind of share those with each other. I like that. And, uh, you know, I think last year my goal was to be more generous, and uh, I think we're just going to kind of keep that one rolling. In part because I I can't think of anything else, and I just have found that to be just a really good thing in in my life. Yeah, no, that is a good. I love that. Yeah, generosity. Yeah, you can't. I mean, there's not much better than that. Uh, I'm trying to think, there was a they quote somebody was talking about recently on the same line, right? Of you know, being a, uh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank, but it was kind of like being a, a giver of information and being somebody who really is just, you know, sharing, they're kind of promoting themselves, right? Sure. And I think that you, obviously, with all these tutorials, it sounds like, is that kind of on the generosity, it's kind of the same sort of thing, right? In line, it's just being generous, being giving for people out there. And, and then you get back probably way more than you give, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm generally speaking, terrible at self-promotion. I think I'm an okay teacher, so <laughs> that's kind of what I have to offer. And, you know, people, I hope, can find that beneficial and, and useful in their life. So That's right. Do you find the business stuff, the business end of it, is something you really enjoy? Or is some of that stuff like you could just assume give it to somebody to take that, <laughs> the marketing and all that stuff? I don't do any marketing. I don't do any advertising. It's just 100% word of mouth for me. So far, that's worked. You know, business is growing. And uh, I think that's where it's kind of funny and like more of a small specialized market that, you know, the rules kind of there are rules that apply, but they're not the standard rules. So, yeah, it's been a great fit because I don't have any interest in doing a whole lot of social media stuff and I haven't. Needed. That is really cool. Yeah. So you guys, I mean, I'm sure you're out there on social, but you really don't don't post a lot or keep up with that much. <laughs> not a whole lot. I mean, I pro I should do more with that being said. Well, I think what you should do is do, I mean, I, that's what's cool to hear is that I think you should do what you enjoy because I always, you know, it's terrible to think to do something you don't like to do, right? So, if, true. you know what I mean? If you're finding something that you're successful without having to do it, then geez, I mean, more power to you, right? I mean, I think that some people probably really love the social media. I mean, I, I love, uh, I don't necessarily love it, but I love talking to people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's probably, you probably talk to a lot of people like daily, right? Just people with questions. Absolutely. Yep. Cool, Matt. Well, I think um, this has been a good little update for me. I wanted to do a couple things, get an update on you and just, you know, let you know, I've still got that rod and I want to get that going again. So I guess my New Year's resolution on that end would be to get that thing done. What would be a good time frame if I, let's just say I had, let's just go an hour a week. I got an hour to put in. I could sit down one on the weekend and put an hour in. How many hours do I need to put this rod together? Let's see. Spay rod. I would say, uh, probably like three weeks, maybe like three hours. Oh, wow. So three, literally three hours, this rod's going to be done. Yeah. Yep. I think that's reasonable. That's it. Okay. So this is, uh, this is even better than I thought. So I got to, it actually, I already started, like I said, I got the handle on, so I'm going to get this right now. I'm going to set aside some time, get this going and I'll check back with you. Maybe we could do that check back here in, uh, next year and let you know how it goes. And maybe I'll, if I can get it done, I'll, I'll get a, a post for you to put up on salt or I'll share it. I'll tag you out there. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, good, good. I mean, I guess that's the thing with the fishing too, right? You must get people that build your rods and then they're like, hey, I just caught, you know, my first whatever pike. Do you find that is something you're seeing out there? 
Yeah, all the time. I get a ton of emails of people, you know, sending. Usually right now it's been bamboo rods that people have restored. But yeah, you know, I love that stuff. Uh, people send pictures of fish that they've been catching and rods they've been restoring. And uh, yeah, I just find that really motivating. Cool, cool. All right, well, leave us as we get out of here. Just leave us with their, um, I'm always thinking movies, uh, you know, music, books, kind of some of the arts and stuff. What is your, what about music? Do you listen while you're building rods? Do you listen to music? I do usually. Um, let's see, what have I been listening to lately? Kind of flashback. I've been listening to who, um, a bunch of like Counting Crows stuff. Totally, Counting Crows. How do you listen? How do you get your stuff? Do you do like a Spotify or how do you listen to your music? Yeah, usually Spotify. Yeah, it's crazy. Spotify is, it's unbelievable because it's always been, they're doing awesome with the podcasting stuff. They've been kind of leading on things, but they're also, all the music is there. It just seems almost impossible, right? How is all the music on Spotify and then it only costs like 10 bucks a month? Seriously, like, I don't know about you, but I feel like back in the day, I spent a fortune on like oh, man. physical media, you know? Totally. Did you ever do the CD? Remember the BMG and stuff where you buy the CDs? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I remember that buying the CDs and that was cool. But yeah, it's like Spotify is unbelievable. And I guess Apple Pod or Apple Music, right? There's some other ones, but it just seems like they have it nailed. And like right now, I could just go on and put on Counting Crows. I could put on Counting Crows radio. Yep. It's gonna give me some other Counting Crows. I mean, and I will put a Counting Crows video in the show notes because we want to make <laughs> sure I what was their one? What was one of their one popular? What was that song that was uh probably Mr. Jones is one you're thinking yeah. of, but yeah, Mr. Jones. I think a great rod wrapping song is going to be a long December. Oh, long December. Yeah, that's right. Okay, we'll do long December. We'll put that <laughs> in the show notes and, uh, and I'll queue it up here on Spotify. Nice. So nice. Um, cool, Matt. Well, thanks for the update. And, you know, thanks again for sending that rod there. I'm going to definitely uh, get that together uh, this year and I'll check back with you. And glad to hear you still got this going strong and we'll definitely keep in touch with you moving ahead in, in 2023. That sounds great. Yeah, I appreciate everything you do. You know, it's great that uh, you give a voice to so many different types of people and businesses and, you know, just various fishing techniques in the fly fishing world. So I appreciate that. Nice. Yeah, thanks, Matt. All right, man. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. So there it is. Wetflyswing.com slash 404. Quick listener shout out before we jump out of here. Fred Cook from Louisville, Texas. Thanks, Fred, for all your listens and shares this week. Uh, if you are from Texas and we haven't uh, and I haven't talked to you yet, it'd be great if you can connect with me right now uh, on social media or by email. Uh, whatever is convenient for you, just uh, click that button and uh, and drop me a message. Let me know you're listening to this podcast and uh, and where you're coming from. Where are we going next? Where are we going? Let's take a quick peek. Uh, we've got some good stuff coming up here. Tomorrow, we've got Dave, David Gravett, Pro Skateboard. This is a pretty interesting one, a fun episode. Uh, we dig into it. David has broken most of the bones in his body, and he digs into that and how he got into fly fishing, a, a real fun one. And then next week, we got Big George Cook back on the podcast to dig into uh, King Salmon Fishing uh, and some other stuff there with George. Uh, we get into some history on some of the uh, the brands and companies he's affiliated with and then that same week on thursday we got phil roley coming on here for the first episode of the littoral zone this is a, a new kind of surprise podcast we're doing here with phil who's taking the lead so stay tuned for that one we're going to have a new host that's going to take the lead uh, next week uh, for select episodes focused on steel water all right, that is what I have for you today. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Hope you have a chance to uh, share an episode if you're out there. Click that plus button on Apple Podcast to follow us as well. And uh, yeah, and I appreciate all the support this week. Appreciate the listens. And I hope to maybe catch you up on an upcoming trip. Talk to you maybe on, on the water or maybe catch you online. All right, hope you're having a good and wonderful evening. Hope you're having a great and exceptional morning. Or if it's afternoon, wherever you are in the world, I look forward to catching you on the next podcast. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.